so hello everyone done with the world cup and coming back to our daily routine of daily news simplified so i welcome you all to the today's dns session dated 20th november 2023 the important topics which are to be discussed in this session are listed on your screen we will be covering certain prelims topic as well as mains topic however when we see today's the hindu as well as indian express daily edition we find that today's newspapers are mostly mains oriented okay so from the prelims perspective we will be covering a topic a home warrior then from the economy section we will be covering a topic gi tagged related to the onatukara sesam then from the science and tech section we will be covering an important uh, biotechnology term that is chimera but from the mains perspective today's discussion is going to be a long but a very fruitful one because in today's mains session we will be discussing about the mining industry in india all the challenges associated with it what are the steps taken each and every dimension associated with it and also we'll try to link it with the current affair context that is the recent amendment which has been passed in the mines and minerals development and regulation act then the next topic will be in relation to the robotics as we know that it is exclusively and specifically mentioned in general studies mains paper 3 in science and tech section and we will also cover the pharmaceutical industry the locational factors from the geography perspective as well as the regulation of the pharma industry from the governance and the economy perspective right however the students who want to ask their doubts they should uh, be with me till the end of this session at the end after discussing all these topics we'll try to answer each and every doubt of yours so be with us and we'll try to answer your queries but towards the end of this session right so now let us begin with our first topic and this topic is in relation to the gi tag so first of all what do we understand by gi what is gi actually the full form is geographical indication now as the name is suggesting you there is some indication that is some sign which is given to a particular product on the basis of its geography for example let us say uh, darjeeling tea you all must have heard about darjeeling tea so what does this tea is telling me that this particular product this particular tea has something to do with darjeeling and because such type of tea is specifically and uniquely grown in this area that is why this tea has its some unique properties because of which it gains its prominence in domestic as well as international trade so that is why geographical indication status are given to various products natural as well as artificial also so this should not be confused with the fact that it is only given to the natural products for example the fulkari in punjab is also been given the gi tag banarsi pan is also been given a gi tag okay so gi is basically a sign a symbol given to a specific product having its origin in any one particular geographical area right in this very sense the context in which this onatugara sesam again a different product has appeared in uh, in the newspaper is that because the kerala agriculture university has acquired the gi tag for this sesam growing in the onatugara region of central travancore now when we go by the previous year question paper analysis we find that questions related to gi are uh, very famous when it comes to the prelims examination okay not necessary every year but every two years we do find one or two questions so on an average it comes down to one question at least every year in prelims for example in 2015 the question was asked that which of the following has have been accorded the gi status also you will find a tendency by upsc in prelims examination that the questions which they ask on these gi related products they are not very deep you should be aware that any particular product whether it is it has been accorded a gi status or not and what particular region does that product belong to okay and if that particular product has some unique property of its own these three dimensions are enough from the perspective of the prelims examination so try uh, give yourself a try and attempt this particular question we'll come to this practice question but first let us see certain key facts related to the onatukara sesam right so this is the 
picture where you can see that how this product how this plant looks like basically the most important aspect of this is the its medicinal property and it is not recent from the 18th century the ayurvedic doctors have known the medicinal properties of this very plant and that is why they have used this particular plant in the treatment of diseases related to rheumatism and protection of skin that is dermatologists also were using this particular thing in the broader spectrum of ayurveda right it is found that this plant is high in vitamin e and antioxidants again medicinal properties okay now we all know that rheumatic disease is an umbrella term that refers to the arthritis and several other conditions affecting the bones the joints the tendons in the human body okay this sesam plant is found mostly in the tropical subtropical and southern temperate areas of the world now because they are grown in the tropical areas that is the reason that they are also found in kerala however when we are talking about this particular point we are not only referring to the onatapuram sesam we are talking in general about the sesam species which is found in many areas onatapuram this particular sesam which we are discussing over here which has gained its gi tag is only found in that particular area that is the kerala state right the seeds are also high in protein and rich in thiamine and vitamin b6 it is also used as salad oil cooking oil and various other products like manufacturing of soaps pharmaceuticals lubricants etc okay so these are its uses and its unique properties now let us see the practice question with reference to the gi that is geographical indication consider the following statements and out of these three statements you have to find how many of the above statements are correct statement 1 says onatapura sesam of andhra pradesh has been accorded the gi status this, this is incorrect because it is not andhra pradesh it is which state yeah kerala second it says that onatapuram sesam is high in vitamin e and antioxidants this is correct then this is known for the treatment of rheumatism this is also correct therefore b only two will be the correct answer for this question right a very simple question going by the trend in which the upsc is asking the question related to the gi products okay now moving towards our next topic now this topic is in relation to the recent film festival however an important from the uh, aspirants perspective from the civil service examination perspective an important thing is that the film which has been nominated under this festival is in the relation to the contribution of an very important warrior in our medieval history and the, that warrior is in the ahom kingdom that is why the ahom warriors the context says that an animated masterpiece titled lachit barkhupan now this is uh, this person is very important when it comes to the medieval history especially for the assam region so an animated masterpiece titled lachit the warrior has earned a prestigious spot in the international film festival of 2023 set to unfold in goa it is directed and written by parth sarthi mahanta and ips officer in assam right so now the civil servants are also become very creative and they are using their hobbies also so it is very beneficial for all of you to have a very productive hobby and interest which can also help you in interviews right and later on during the services also okay so this person has written and directed this particular uh, movie so in this very regard from the medieval history perspective let us look at certain key facts related to this particular warrior also again if you see the previous year questions from the last 2 to 3 years we are finding that questions from the medieval history are coming okay so there was a time when there was a very low importance of the medieval history part in the prelims but since last 2 to 3 years the weightage of medieval history has gone up so that is why the question has come and the question will continue to come okay so we'll come to this question first obviously we should learn something about this person okay so first the name is lachit 
बर्फो खान ही वॉज बॉर्न इन असम हिज फादर वॉज कमांडर इन चीफ ऑफ द एहोम आर्मी नो एहोम किंगडम इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ओके तो देर आर सम किंगडम्स विच आर रीजनल किंगडम्स विच कुड नॉट एक्सटेंड देयर एम्पायर टू द होल ऑफ द इंडिया बट दे रिस्ट्रिक्टेड दमसेल्व टू अ पर्टिकुलर रीजन बट देयर कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन इन इंडिया हिस्ट्री इज इमेंस एंड देयर फोर यू पी एस सी इज ऑल्सो आस्किंग द क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम सच रीजनल किंगडम्स ओके तो हिज फादर वॉज कमांडर इन चीफ ऑफ द एहोम आर्मी एंड हेल्ड अ प्रेस्टिजियस पोजिशन ऑफ द लास्ट बरबरुआ नाउ अ डेज दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कास्ट इन दैट पर्टिकुलर एरिया इन द स्टेट ऑफ असाम बट बैक देन दिस बरबरुआ वॉज अ एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव पोस्ट ऑफ काउंसलर हैविंग सर्टन एग्जीक्यूटिव एज वेल एज सर्टन जुडिशियल पावर्स अगेन दोज ऑफ यू हू हैव गॉन थ्रू द प्रीवियस क्वेश्चन यू पीपल मस्ट बी नोइंग द फैक्ट दैट terminology based questions for the medieval history are also asked by upsc okay so when there is a unique term you should know that what is the meaning of this term right so barbaruas were the administrative post of councillors during the ahom kingdom and lachit barfukan's father was the commander in chief their contribution that is the ahom kingdom and specifically the lachit barfukan his his contribution in the medieval history is mainly against the moguls during the times of aurangzeb okay so there was a person mir jumla under aurangzeb who captured the capital of the ahom dynasty they attacked assam now again we know the fact that the north eastern india has been relatively isolated when it comes to the annexation of the india and there is a very simple reason for it the northeastern india had a very rough terrain rugged topography extreme climatic conditions low in mineral resources difficult to build roads tribal culture so there were many reasons because of which many rulers many rulers of the mainland india did not want to attack that particular region okay so there were many factors but yes out of all those states there is one state assam which is plain which has the alluvial soil which has dealt which has the islands which has the water resource in the form of brahmaputra so this assam was attacked because the empire wanted to extend its influence over that region and to capture the resources right so that is why mir jumla attacked and captured the ahom dynasty's capital and treaty of ghila jhari ghat was signed okay so yes the name may sounds different but yes Uh, this name is important so just remember there are some important treaties on which the questions can be asked so treaty of gila jhari ghat that is in 1663 was signed between the armies mughal armies and the ahom army and this attack resulted in the defeat of the ahoms as a result under this treaty there were territorial concessions which were given to mughals war indemnities were paid that is financial burden of the war was laid down to this annual tribute was fixed to be given to the mughal emperor but most humiliating thing which the ahom empire ahom kingdom faced at that point of time under this treaty was there was a demand to send the ahom king's daughter to the imperial harem in delhi and this was the reason which challenged the ahom pride and led to the successive wars by the ahoms against the moguls in that period so there was a king that is chakradwaj singh chakradwaj singh took this responsibility he realigned his forces he organized his army and led the revolt against aurangzeb and the command of this army was given to whom lachit barfukan okay so he determined to reclaim the assam in 1667 and lachit was entrusted to lead the ahom army and this rebellion this revolt this attack was in favor of ahom then in this context two important battles are there one is battle of alaboy 1669 where mughal troops led by ram singh arrived to launch an attack as a result then battle of sarai ghat two years later 1671 it was a desperate battle on the banks of brahmaputra then the moguls were forced to retreat from guwahati 
and hence the significance of the Ahom kingdom during those times which defeated the Mughal army when they were at their peak. Right? So these are certain key facts. So try to learn history in the form of stories remembering certain key facts because only the story will make the history interesting. Right? Now let us look at the practice question from this topic. Consider the following statement with reference to the medieval history of India. There are two statements and you have to find the correct ones. Statement 1 says, in the battle of Sarai Ghat, the Mughal army under Aurangzeb defeated the Ahom army led by Lachit Barfukan. We just saw that in the battle of Sarai Ghat, who was defeated? Mughal army was defeated. And hence, this statement is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. Aurangzeb imposed the treaty of Ghilajari Ghat on Ahom dynasty king after the battle of Alaboy. No, it was not after the battle of Alaboy. It was only this treaty which led to the successor revolts and it was signed much before than the battle of Alaboy. So this is also incorrect and therefore option D, neither one nor two will be the correct answer. Right? As far as the answer to this previous year question is concerned, it is B, two only. Now, moving to the next topic again from the prelims perspective. Okay, but this is the last prelims topic because today we are going to dwell much deeper in the main topics that is the analytical perspective. So this topic has come in the context that recently a study has come out whereby the scientists have reported successful generation of live chimeras. Okay, in the non-human primate species evolutionary close to humans. Now the important thing again is that what do we understand by these genetic chimeras? What does this term signify? If you see previous year question that is just in the uh, this year prelims in 2023, the question was asked aerial metagenomic best refers to which of the following situations. So what does this question signify? And this has been a trend for last five to six years. UPSC tried to identify the terminology based questions which are there in the current affair. Right. So, this gives us a hint that the terms which appear in newspapers are also important. And therefore, we have framed a question in relation to the genetic chimeras that what does this term signify to you. Right. So, this term is important. Basically, the genetic chimera, what is it? It is basically an organism or a tissue that contains at least two different sets of DNA because of which a single organism has two different set of properties. For example, let's say if I was experiencing this genetic chimera, then my one eye would have been black and my, my second eye would have been blue. Are you getting it? So this is the thing. If you look at this particular uh, species, this one, you will see the difference in colors of uh, in the body of the same species. Now, this is genetic chimera. Why does it happen is that because this organism has received two entirely different set of DNA, right? And they are most often they originate from the fission of different zygotes. Basically, the thing is that genetic chimera is any organism or a tissue which is having two different set, two or more than two different set of DNAs. Okay, if you see this particular question, you will find, if you see the option B that it is a single organism composed of cells with more than one distinct genotype. Are you getting it? This is what genetic chimera is. Okay, as far as the answer to this Previous year question is concerned, it is understanding the genetic, no, this uh, option A will be the correct answer that is collecting the DNA samples from air in a habitat at one go, right? So these terminology based questions becomes important. From the civil services perspective, only this information was relevant that you understand what does this term means. However, the fodder material is provided to you in the word and the PDF format so you can study about it most important thing we are discussing in this session, right? Now come to the mains perspective and our first topic 
is in relation to the mining industry now this topic has come in the indian express newspaper if you closely analyze the syllabus this topic specifically has mentioned in general studies mains paper 3 right but upsc asked the question this question in 2022 in general studies mains paper 1 so upsc can ask the question in any paper it is their wish okay so the question was asked in a format that despite india being one of the countries of the gondwana land that is they try to give the context in the question in relation to the geography okay its mining industry contributes much less to its gdp in percentage discuss basically you were asked to bring out the challenges that why the mining industry is not contributing much to india's gdp getting it so that is why in this article also because the author has come up with the uh, challenges and some solutions related to mining industry in today's session we will be discussing various facts related to the india's mining industry so we will be discussing the multiple challenges associated with this sector the steps which have already been taken by the government we will also be discussing that what can be the suggestions way ahead for uh, to address this particular issue in this relation we will also be connecting it with the recent amendment in the mines and minerals development and regulation act right so this will be a lengthy topic but yes a very important topic okay so just be with me and we'll try to decode this topic in as simple manner as we can first of all let us try to understand that what are the various challenges when it comes to the mining industry of india okay again if you have to brainstorm this topic what will you think you will think that what is mining all about and only then you can think about various challenges so if we understand that by mining we mean extraction that is the commercial extraction of minerals can we think about various challenges associated with it yes we can think because first challenge is in relation to the mineral exploration itself okay the thing is that in india there is a highly uneven distribution of minerals you will find the major mineral belts in which region of india in the peninsular region as well as in the eastern plateau region some belts are also in their central hills central region but minerals are lacking in the northern plains that is the plains of punjab haryana uttar pradesh bihar bengal assam all this belt is lacking in mineral deposits rajasthan is again lacking in heavy minerals okay so there is a very high uneven distribution of minerals again this will be true for almost any geographical region any geographical unit because the minerals are the direct outcome of the rock types which are the outcome of not a homogeneous processes right so there is an uneven distribution of minerals second issue is that the regions in which these minerals are found they have a very rough terrain they have a very rough physiography for example if we are telling you that you will find a coal in a region which is a plateau region so that is very obvious that that level that uh, area that land is not leveled because there will be huge crests and troughs those regions will also be having very dense forests those regions are also having the tribal culture because of which the issues in the exploration of the minerals they gain their magnitude then availability of capital and technology with india is also very low right so we do not have such sophisticated machines we still do not use robotics in this very context when we compare india's explore, uh, exploration with the other major powers let's say us china or some european countries also like germany france etc we find that we are lacking in technology we are not using automation robotics especially when it comes to the deep seated minerals and similarly there is issue with capital so the public sector undertakings which are involved in this extraction they have their own issues hence 
this issue becomes also important that is the plaguing PSUs. They do not have the required skill sets. They do not have adequate human resources. They do not have the capital. There is a government monopoly, which means there is no competition, right? So all the challenges which are plaguing our PSUs will obviously directly impact their outcome when it comes to the exploration of the minerals. It is very obvious, right? Then this mining industry is very capital intensive. Yes, you require funds. That is true. And we do not have funds. But thing is, by the nature of this industry, it is very capital intensive. Why? First, there are huge costs when it comes to the leasing agreements of the minerals. So their lease is very costly. Second is the process of land acquisition. If from a particular region you are going to extract minerals, so that means you have to, government has to acquire a land. If the government is acquiring a land, that means government has to pay compensation. We all know that in the rural areas, the compensation is around four times of the prevailing market value or the circle rate of that particular region, right? In the urban areas, it comes to two times. So four times of the rural, two times of the urban property rates the capital, the cost of this land acquisition becomes very high. So it uh, leads to the financial burden on the government, right? Then it comes to the infrastructural deployment. Again, if you are establishing a mining industry, you are mining, so you need tractors, you need trucks, you need communication lines, you need towers, you need a whole new lot of mega uh, infrastructure projects in those regions. Then a huge workforce is required. You have to pay salary to that workforce. That is why this industry per se becomes very capital intensive. Right? Land acquisition, we have discussed this issue in this context. Okay, it becomes a problem. And land acquisition, more importantly, is not just a financial problem. It is also a socio social problem because the land acquisition is going to displace the people on the mass Scale, there will be mass displacement. If the people are getting displaced, then just the compensation is not going to actually compensate their worries, right? You provide the money, but that is not enough because there are huge chances that the social fabric of that region might have lost. If a person is dislocated from point A to point B, so in the point B, he must not be having the families, the friend circle in that area right so this is a, a negative obvious negative outcome of any migration whether it is forced migration or a voluntary migration but yes it leads to the social problems and these social problems aggravates when it comes to the mass displacement of the tribal people you displace the tribal people from those remote areas and then you try to mainstream them in the urban areas that is not going to happen very smoothly right then comes to the forests and environment. Now when you will see, if you try to draw India's map and you will, uh, it is just a coincidence, not a coincidence, there are reasons for this, but yes, if you draw the India's map, you will find that the most of the regions which are rich in minerals are also rich in forest, right? So when the government also has a responsibility of protecting the forest government has a responsibility of economic growth for which it is trying to promote the mining industry that is what we are discussing but it also has the responsibility to preserve the forest because so basically again the crux of the environmental studies from the civil service examination perspective is what to resolve the conflict between the economy and the environmental needs okay so here also when there is a responsibility, government tries to make several laws which will regulate these mining operations in such eco-fragile areas. When they come up with different laws, so obviously from the economy perspective that is going to hinder the mining operations. So that is why it also becomes a challenge, right? Then plaguing PSUs, we have discussed this issue. Okay. So these are certain challenges because of which Despite being one of the countries of the Gondwana land, the uh, contribution of the mining industries in the India's GDP is low. Right? Okay. Now, let us discuss certain steps which are taken by the government recently in last four to five years of span. 
in order to boost the mining industry in order to resolve such issues up to some extent okay so these uh, steps are uh, very obvious for example the government has tried to auction the mining lease basically this is done with the two fold objective one is to enhance the transparency second is to attract the private players so when the private players will be attractive they will bring with them what one capital which was lacking in the psus second they will bring with them what competition which was again lacking in the psus third they will also bring with them the skills as well as innovations which again lacks in certain psus of india right second is the formation of district minerals foundation in order see because only the central regulation or the central steps in this particular sphere will not be sufficient so there has to be a continuous governance and more importantly at the grassroots level there has to be a continuous governance in this perspective so that is why at the district level the government took the step to form the district mineral foundations then the government also formed the national mineral exploration trust it also established the mining surveillance system so the main objective of the mining surveillance system was to curb the illegal mining okay now in these issues when we were discussing the challenges one very important challenge got missed which is in relation to the corruption okay corruption is also very huge when it comes to the mining industry not only in the sand mining but overall mining of the minerals this industry faces a lot of corruption and hence the surveillance system is established then there were amendment in 2023 in the mines and minerals development and regulation act so in next slide we will be discussing the features of it and analyzing this amendment also but before that let us look certain way ahead which you can write in your answers which you can provide as your own solutions one reduce the mining cost by reducing the taxes providing rational subsidies as well as investing in technology then government must focus on private as well as the foreign collaboration in order to increase the innovation and skills and bring in the most newer practices in this particular field then digitization is the need of the hour in order to promote transparency as well as to analyze the data on real time basis okay then center and state coordination is must in this particular industry so these are certain steps which you can write in this line let us discuss this point in detail because again in the mains there can be an overall question which upsc has already asked in 2022 then there can be an independent question also on the amendment of this particular act right you might be asked to analyze the issues or various features of this particular amendment so let us discuss this thing mines and minerals development and regulation act it was the act which was passed in 1957 okay so in 2023 the government is trying to amend this particular act so 1957 act basically dealt with three important activities in the overall mining sector which are those three activities one is the reconnaissance now in this topic in this discussion there will be few terminologies which are technical but it is not very difficult okay so i'll break them these uh, i'll break these technologies for you okay let us try to understand that if you are going if you are an installation you are going to mine any particular area what will be the first thing which you are going to do first thing which be will be that you will conduct the preliminary surveys right so you will conduct a survey and you will have a rough estimation that which type of mineral is found in this region what can be a rough quantity of it okay this is a just a preliminary survey just like the preliminary exam okay the overview this is known as the reconnaissance this is the preliminary survey right once you have conducted this survey and once you are sure that there is a rich mineral deposit in this region the second thing will be that 
you will prove this fact that on the basis of this survey you will prove the fact that this region has such much deposits that is the mains examination you will prove this fact that you are capable of joining this service right so this is the second stage is prospecting that is proving the deposits okay and then you will enter with uh, enter into certain agreements with the state government with the central government you will take the permissions and all those things will be done once you have proved the fact that there are such reserves of deposits the third thing is the mining that is the commercial extraction got it so basically 57 act dealt with all the three activities that is preliminary survey that is reconnaissance second proving the deposits that is prospecting third extraction of minerals that is mining for all these three different activities there were different permissions which were given under this act right this is true okay now let us understand the features of this act in 2023 the amendment one okay so this was in 1957 first and the foremost feature of this amendment in 2023 is that the government is now attracting the private sector for the exploration licenses now what is this exploration licenses again let us try to understand this basically earlier as we discussed that in 1957 act the licenses were given for three activities reconnaissance prospecting and mining okay in this amendment there is a four category this fourth category is the exploration license now this is the fourth category of license first was the reconnaissance license then prospecting license then mining license and now the fourth category is added that is the exploration license now what do we mean by exploration license again or uh, for this to understand in the previous act that is in 1957 act there were few minerals which were classified as the atomic minerals right so tell me the atomic minerals come under the control of government whether the government has the monopoly or the private players are also allowed in this in extracting these atomic minerals tell me so the thing was in 1957 act these atomic minerals were under the complete monopoly of the government right why because of the obvious reasons that these minerals are very radioactive these minerals are very strategic right they uh, they are very difficult to handle and there can be a huge security lapses also so there are huge chances of misuse that is why the government said that these atomic minerals will be under their monopoly okay one thing but when you will see the list of these atomic minerals no these atomic minerals obviously they will have the uranium they will have the plutonium they will have the thorium all these minerals will be there but there is an there were other minerals also which were classified in the atomic mineral list but they were not radioactive for example lithium so now you will understand that why this amendment has been brought in because we know that in the present times the importance of lithium has gained okay the, uh, the importance of lithium has increased so that is why and also the lithium because it's not radioactive so obviously it is not logical to keep lithium and other such minerals under the atomic mineral list so that is why lithium as well as other minerals in order to bring them out of the atomic mineral list this amendment has been passed so for those minerals which are brought out of the atomic mineral list and has been uh, and the private sector has been allowed to enter to explore those minerals to have the license the license which is required to explore these minerals is known as the exploration license are you getting it that means that exploration license is that license which is required by the entity which is interested in exploring those minerals which earlier were under the atomic mineral list but now has been declassified now they are not under the atomic mineral list one category is those minerals second if the private players are also interested in extracting those minerals which are deep seated minerals for example gold silver 
etcetera as well as the critical minerals then also to explore these minerals they require a reconnaissance license hence the fourth category of license has been added do you get it also because we have talked about lithium in this continuation there are six minerals which have come out of the atomic mineral list now which are those minerals again from the prelims perspective also this information is important lithium niobium titanium tantalium zirconium and beryllium just six names obviously you can memorize them okay so to explore this exploration license is required again exploration license is also required for the deep sea in minerals like gold silver copper cobalt etc basically exploration license is required for those minerals which are mentioned in the seventh schedule total number is 29 that is not important but yes exploration what is exploration license this is exploration license okay so we have discussed this point we have discussed this point next comes this point reconnaissance for subsurface activities is also allowed okay i hope this is not very technical na i am trying to make it as simple as i can again let us understand let us decode this point so this is the earth surface right the minerals obviously you will find below the earth surface okay so these are the minerals which you need to extract as we have discussed there is a three stage process one is the preliminary surveys that is reconnaissance then is prospecting and then is mining so in the preliminary survey in this particular act that is 1957 what was allowed was the surface activities for example they allowed geo mapping right they allowed aerial surveys they allowed geophysical and chemical surveys basically all the activities which this act allowed during the first stage that is the reconnaissance stage that is the pre preliminary survey stage at that stage all the activities which were involved were those activities which can be taken only above the earth surface aerial surveys geophysical mapping geochemical mapping every activity is taking above the earth surface no activity could be taken below the earth surface no no activity below the subsurface levels for example there in the first stage you cannot go for drilling the earth surface in order to have the preliminary surveys now don't you think as an industrialist preliminary surveys will require drilling also to have a better assessment of the uh, potential of that particular region in the context of resources right so that is why in this amendment reconnaissance that is the preliminary survey that is the first stage for the subsurface activities like drilling trenching pitting is also allowed got it simple first private sector is attracted is invited for the exploration license what is exploration license we have discussed here then we have discussed that in the first stage now the sub surface activities are also allowed okay next moving to the next feature exclusive auction mining leases has been given to the center that means auction mining lease this power has been given exclusively to the center in order to have better control as well as uniformity in this particular sector got it next is there are the provisions of time limits that the auction has to be dis, uh, done in a prescribed time okay so there can be a huge lapses basically if you see that all these amendments all these features are in order to boost the mining industry now if you understand that these are the features these are the amendments again you can analyze the positive as well as negative for example positive if you are allowing the private sector to enter into the deep sea and critical minerals the positive is they will bring with them capital skills innovation entrepreneurship competition etc it will the mining industry will get a boost but the negative is that there will be higher exploration there will be higher extraction of minerals which can go against the environment there can be uh, the tribal rights can be hurt okay so all those things again if you understand the features you can analyze merits as well as demerits are also explicitly given to you in the handouts in the word and pdf format so obviously you can refer to them also 
but i think that if you understand these features you will be able to understand the merits as well as demerits also so i hope this topic is clear to you again if you people have any doubts you can ask me towards the end of the session i'll give you the time okay now let us move towards the next topic again from the mains perspective now from the subject of science and tech in the subsection of robotics so the news has appeared in the context of the multinational company that is amazon and how they are using the robots in their manufacturing and production processes but from the examinations perspective what is more important is that whether india is doing such things or not and if not then what are the challenges right what are the applications of robotics in various fields when it comes to india okay so let us discuss this thing also india and robots first of all the bureau of indian standards that is bis they have three category of robots right again an information which can be handy in prelims examinations so there are three category of robots one is industrial robots obviously those robots which are there Uh, involved in the industrial processes for example manufacturing production etc so those robots are the industrial robots second is the service robots for example the robots which can be used in a shop which can be used in your homes which can also be used in the hospitals those are the service robots third is the medical robots these are those robots <coughs> these are those robots actually which are used for the medical purposes so again not to be con just minute just confirm if i am audible to you please confirm if i am audible okay thank you actually my mic got dropped okay so that's why yeah so we were discussing that bi has bis has uh, provided three category of robots one is the industrial robot service robots and the medical robots so if there is a robot which is there in the hospital that is not a medical robot that will come under a service robot for example if the robot is coming to you and providing you the medicines right but if the robot is used to deliver a medicine inside your body that will be a medical robot basically these are three categories by the bis right now come to the application which is very important from the mains examinations perspective so we have classified the application of robotics for india in four primary sectors that is industry agriculture health and security right again very simple points in industry the rob robots can be used in production as well as automation processes they can also be used in logistics as well as the warehousing facilities robots can be used robots can pick up a material then they can transport it to a different shelf and they can keep it there okay so that is how the robots are used basically robots are doing those things which humans are doing right reducing the errors there are chances that uh, there will be reduced error when robots will be operating in such scenarios okay in not in every scenario there will be reduced error but yes in industries in certain spheres there are chances of reducing the error then the workers safety so there are certain industrial processes which can be detrimental to the human lives for example we just talked about mining right so we have heard about many news it at items during which there has been an incident reported incidents of the mine collapse leading to the deaths of several workers so in such extreme environments don't you think that we can send robots to explore or to have the survey or to do whatever activities which we want 
robots we can send them so that there is a less chances of loss of the human lives right similarly when it comes to the agriculture nowadays robots are also used to collect the agricultural products the produces in france the robots are used to catch the oranges so the robots go to the field they pluck the oranges they keep them in the basket and then they come right the things which humans do robots are also doing them similarly they can be used to monitor the soil health as well as the crop health they can be used to spray pesticides again when the humans are spraying the pesticides so obviously they also expose themselves to the detrimental health impacts of the pesticides all those chemicals so again in those areas where there are possibilities of the negative human health we can use robots precision farming also what is precision farming just deduce it by the name agriculture which is done very precisely for example if you are sowing a seed let's say this is the earth surface if you have to sow the seed up to what depth exactly up to what depth that is 2 cm 1 cm 5 cm exactly up to what depth that seed has to be sown the work of the robots will come into play what is the moisture level which particular area in the field any particular seed can be sown again satellite will be used robots will be used and that is how the precision farming will be done right then comes to the third sphere that is the robots and health they can be used as cleaning and disinfectant agents they can also be used to monitor the conditions of the patients they can also be a surgical robots for example the mini robots they can be sent inside the human bodies to deliver a medicine at the target areas there are robot induced surgeries also right so the surgeries are being done by the robots then comes the fourth dimension that is security so in this robots can be used to detect any possible mines they can be used for surveillance especially in the border areas they can there can be combat robots also so there might be a time when the armies would be fighting but both of the armies will be made up of robots right then remote vehicles that is unmanned uavs unmanned aerial vehicles again it is a robot right so there are multiple areas in which we can uh, use the robots but then there are challenges associated with it again a very simple and generic challenges one is the skills how many of today's engineers in india which we are producing are doing robotics as an important course right so there is an issue of skills development then there is huge import dependence in the robots which are being made for example the robot is having the electrical equipment and if it is having lithium also as an important component do we have lithium no so we have to import so despite the fact that if we have to make robots we have to be dependent on the products which we are not having which we have to import then energy and internet there are many areas in india where still there is no internet the connectivity is not there right even not even the electricity has reached to those areas for 24 hours so obviously there are challenges related to internet as well as continuous energy to support this whole ecosystem then issues of capital as well as regulation so you allow the making of uavs but again you cannot make your own uav and you cannot make your drone and you can take up beyond a certain height be, uh, uh, without taking the necessary clearances and permissions from the government so yes there is a regulation issue also then r and d india still invests a lot less money in the research and development okay when compared with the countries like south korea china or us okay it is almost around 1% when it comes to india right on the contrary when we go to china it is around 30 to 35% when we go to south korea so the thing is that we are not investing much money in the research and development if we are not doing it then how are we going to progress in this particular capital intensive industry then there are ethical concerns also involved with this industry with the robots for example you mix the robots 
विद द आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस विद द डीप फेक टेक्नोलॉजी एंड वी ऑल नो द इश्यूज द रिसेंट इश्यूज विद इंपॉर्टेंट सेलिब्रिटीज विच हैव रूज विच हैव अराइज बिकॉज ऑफ दिस डीप फेक टेक्नोलॉजी सो देर आर ह्यूज एथिकल इश्यूज इन्वॉल्व ऑल्सो राइट तो दीज आर दर्टन चैलेंजेस वेन इट कम्स टू दी रोबोटिक्स इंडस्ट्रीज ऑफ इंडिया ओके सो आई होप दैट दिस टॉपिक विल हेल्प यू to write beautiful mains answer because that is the only objective why we are investing so much time and so much energy in this just to write a good mains answer right okay now the last topic again from the mains perspective so the topic has again appeared in indian express newspaper in the context of the regulatory procedures of the drug pharmaceutical ecosystem in india okay so basically in recent years the adverse reports on the indian generic medicines have led to questions with the pharma industry at least seven indian made cough syrup have been flagged as substandard by who that is the world health organization now this topic again from the examinations perspective need to be dealt in two broad spheres one will be general studies paper 1 section geography sub section of locational factors right the second section will be from the general studies mains paper 2 the section of governance because the context is mentioning the regulatory procedure okay so this section is going to be factual whereby we will learn that which are various organizations which are involved in the overall regulatory ecosystems of the drugs or the pharmaceuticals in india okay so that is why this information will also be relevant when it comes to prelims examination not just the mains okay because here we will be dealing with certain important bodies regulatory bodies okay here it will be more analytical so let us try to understand this topic now there is a very uh, famous question if you see this map this map shows you the concentration of the pharmaceutical industries in india right if you closely see don't you think that most of the pharmaceutical industries are concentrated in the western indian part especially the west coastal region and that too of gujarat and maharashtra what is the reason for this why the pharma industry is more concentrated on india's west coast if you understand the basic reasons which are responsible for which affect the distribution of pharma industries then you can easily uh, come up with the answers for this question that why it is concentrated on the west coast because the factors the general factors which are responsible for the distribution of pharma industry will be the those factors which are operating in this particular region only that is why the industries are located here na hence we'll see first reason is abundance of petrochemical hubs in this particular region right so these petrochemical hubs the final the waste product or many of the raw materials many of the chemicals all these things which are used by petrochemical hubs which are concentrated here they are also used by the pharmaceutical industries many of the waste products of these petrochemical hubs act as a raw material act as a chemicals in these pharmaceutical industries so that is why if there is a region which is dominated by petrochemical hub it will automatically attract the pharmaceutical industries also are you getting it second is proximity to the ports now here on the western coast we also have many big large ports we also have minor ports so these ports basically serve many purposes for example they allow the import of the active pharmaceutical ingredients import is easy because india lacks in api we are dependent on the imports so if we are dependent on the imports so the api which is coming to the western coast don't you think it is logical to establish the this pharmaceutical industry there only in close proximity to the port 
सेकेंड इज द अवेलेबिलिटी ऑफ मार्केट ऑल्सो बिकॉज इन दी वेन वी सी दी वेस्टर्न कोस्ट ऑफ इंडिया हेयर वी ऑल्सो हैव द एफ्रीकन रीजन वेयर मोस्ट ऑफ द आर ड्रग्स आर सोल्ड सो एफ्रीका एज अ कॉन्टिनेंट सर्व एज एन इंपॉर्टेंट मार्केट फॉर इंडिया एंड फ्रॉम द वेस्टर्न कोस्ट इट इज ईजिली टू एक्सपोर्ट द मेडिसिन टू एफ्रीका राइट then these ports also have very good warehousing facilities as well as the storage facilities they also have a very huge a very uh, better logistics in order to store these products hence the proximity to port set then third is the capital as well as entrepreneurship and skills now again if you divide india from center that is the western part and the eastern part where do you think that there is more capital there is more entrepreneurship there is more business there is more skills so the western part of india this region basically it is a uh, more advanced compared to this eastern part right so hence the this capital entrepreneurship and skills further attract these industries then higher per capita income again if we compare these states like gujarat and maharashtra with the eastern states let's say uh, bihar or west bengal or odisha or chatisgarh obviously we know that most of the uh, per higher per capita income lies in these particular states if there is higher per capita income then there will be a large consumption of these medicines also right then these states have taken a lot of measures in the context of ease of doing business which automatically attract the private industrialist right then industrial inertia is also there because this region is rich in industries industrial inertia is basically a phenomena which attract the which attract more industries by the virtue of the fact that this region was already rich in industries okay so basically if you have to uh, deploy your industry so you will plant your industry in that region which already has the industrial base na you cannot establish your industry in a isolated region because then supply there will be a lot of issues related to supply chain transportation forward backward linkages etc okay so this is the industrial inertia this region is automatically rich in industries hence it attracts this pharmaceutical industries also okay so these are the reasons that why pharma industries is mainly concentrated on india's west coast so this was the first part which we have discussed from the gs1 paper the second part is going to be in relation to the governance again this is a factual part the fodder material will be there okay so just have a look that how the drug regulation works in india okay again facts not much to understand there is no analysis but yes let us see the overall framework which governs the regulation of the drug ecosystem is the drugs and cosmetics act of 1940 this act provide the powers to both that is center as well as state so both the or both center as well as state have the powers when it comes to drug regulation there are certain key authorities these authorities are also important from the prelims examinations perspective the first authority is the central drug standards control organization that is cdsco key facts related to this body it is under ministry of health and family welfare more important fact is it is not a statutory body right what are various functions of this body approval of new drugs registration and control of imported drugs approval of clinical trials laying down the standards for drugs cosmetics etc okay second at the state level we have the body straight drug regulatory authorities this is a statutory body right so this is created under the drugs and the cosmetics act 1940 what is the function of these bodies these bodies have the function relation to licensing and inspection of manufacturing establishments 
and sale premises, monitoring the quality of the drugs, cancellation of the license, surveillance, etc. See, again, from the police perspective, these facts are important. But from the main perspective, you should understand when you will go through the function and responsibilities of all these organizations, that is CDSCO, SDRA, then Drug Controller General of India, then Drug Technical Advisory Board, you will see that there is a huge overlapping in the mandate, function and responsibilities of these bodies. For example, when you see the licensing is also dealt by DCGI. It oversees the functioning of CDSCO and it also responsible for granting the license and monitoring the safety, quality and efficacy of the So it is also seeing the license. State authorities are also seeing the license. So don't you think there is the overlapping of functions and powers? This creates the biggest hurdle, the confusion when it comes to the drug regulatory ecosystem and hence it creates a hurdle, a roadblock in this particular system. Okay, so in this regard, let us see that what are various challenges when it comes to the regulation of the pharma ecosystem. Now we are dealing it from the GS2 perspective, regulatory bodies, the regulation issues. First is outsourcing of the smaller units. Now again this is pretty much self understood. So this was the company but it outsourced many of its operation to several small small entities. Right. So don't you think to regulate or to monitor any one big entity is far more easier than monitoring and regulating a whole bunch, a whole lot of smaller, smaller units which is spread across the country, right? So hence, it leads to difficult enforcement of the act. Second, ambiguous distribution of the powers and responsibilities, we have discussed it. Next, lack of independence and autonomy. We discussed that because CDSCO is not a statutory body, hence it's la it lacks autonomy it lacks independence, right? SDRAs, because they are formed in different, different states, they lack uniformity and proper demarcation of responsibilities, right? Then insufficient resources in terms of financial resources, in terms of human resources, as well as in terms of technical resources. We have discussed this in the previous topic also. We know that in almost every sphere we will be lacking, uh, we will be lacking finance, technology as well as the human resource. Not every, but almost every sphere. Okay. Then there is a lack of transparency also. The decision making process within the drug regulatory system in India is often opaque. And there is a lack of mandatory and comprehensive information sharing from the regulator in the public domain. Now, because health is a subject which is equally important to every citizen and hence the drug ecosystem, the pharmaceutical industrial ecosystem is also important. That is why when we will come to the way forward, an important suggestion will be that there should be mandatory and comprehensive regular information sharing mechanism by these companies or by the regulators with the general public as well as with the parliamentary committees okay in order to have a better transparency okay so let us discuss the way forward also streamlined regulation system defining the exact roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders of so that there should be no overlapping of responsibilities and powers right second is the statutory recognition for the cdsco in order to enhance its autonomy correct then international collaboration with bodies like who as well as with other bodies of other countries also in order to bring innovation experience as well as the best practices involved right Enhancing transparency and accountability by making information sharing mandatory and comprehensive, which are discussed. And the last point is strengthen the capacity building. There should be a continuous training programs for the regulatory officials also. Only then there will be better quality of medicines, and there then you will not be finding the news that WHO has found the seven cuff syrups as substandard 
in India. Right? So this was all about this topic and today's session is also over. But yes, as we have promised, I am here so that you people can ask your doubts. Feel free to ask your doubts related to the topics. Right? Okay, so Rupam Barman is asking a doubt, how much time is left, sir? For the examination, you know how much time is left. Until that time, you have to devote each and every minute to the preparation, right? Tamanna Fayas PDFs and Word files will be uh, there in the description box so you can access them from the description box, right? Any other doubt? Okay, so Khabri Lala is asking, please explain the exploration license once again. So Khabri Lala, as your name suggests, you should have the khabar of the exploration license also, right? Yeah, so let me discuss this uh, exploration license. This was the topic, okay, yeah. So let us again try to understand Basically, the exploration license is that license which deals with those products which now, after the amendment of 2023, now the private players can extract. For example, if a private player has to uh, extract a mineral, has to mine a mineral which is lithium which is deep seated like gold, which is like critical mineral like beryllium. So if the uh, industrialist has to mine this mineral, then he has to take a license and that license is known as the exploration license. This is the newest category of license, the fourth category of license, which has been included in this particular amendment of 2023, right? Yes, any other doubt? Yes, Rupam, the news analysis is enough for prelims as well as mains. See, you just imagine that every year, if you are covering around six to eight topics, including prelims as well as mains, so just imagine about the number of the topics from the prelims as well as mains perspective at the end of the year, just before the examination. Right. Even if you take four topics on an average daily, after one month you are having 120 topics, around 100 topics. Okay. Then multiply it with the number of months. So yes, it is sufficient. Just be regular with all these things. Okay. Any other doubt? If you have. Please ask, otherwise we will be winding up the session. PDF नहीं मिलता, PDF मिलता है, PDF बिल्कुल मिलेगा, ठीक है? Okay, so I guess that's all. Thank you everyone. Still, if you have doubts, you can reach us in our institute also. You can reach us in the uh, with the faculty in the next DNS also. Uh, Nadir Khan is saying, sir, if we make notes on the DNS on the daily basis, it is necessary to read focus. See, the focus is a different product, so you have to read focus. Okay. The DNS is a video product, focus is a literature product, it is writing. So, obviously, do, uh, you should read focus, that is my recommendation, and you should also watch the DNS, right? Rupam, uh, your earlier 
uh, if you have missed the earlier uh, these dns rupam is saying that missed your earlier news analysis so there is nothing to worry okay you can find all the videos on our uh, youtube channel and also whatever has gone uh, obviously you can just be regular from today onwards okay just be with us in every video lecture and be continuous and be sincere okay so every topic will eventually will covered before the examination right you can check the description box for the notes in pdf as well as word format so it is there okay welcome nadir okay okay thank you everyone all the very best and study hard